Happy Sunday, everybody. Glad you're all here and glad there's some people watching online. I hear there are people in Oregon and even as far as the, the deep south state of Arizona watching with us today. So that's pretty awesome. We pray God's blessing on them. So we are meeting here this Sunday for God to, to call us, to draw us closer to him, that we are in our series called Win the Day, right? That sounds exciting. Doesn't that sound motivating? Win the Day with the kind of thought that we want to just win one day at a time for God. And if we can win one day at a time for God, we can do it another day and another day and another day and draw closer to the Lord that when God calls us, we can pretty much do anything for one day, right? In the Lord, if it's in his will. And we realize as we come together this morning that God does not want his people to do one thing. And you know what that is? Stay stagnant. Stay still. He doesn't want his people stagnant. God comes to us in salvation and saves us. And the Bible says that in salvation we are instantly a new creation and therefore all things are new. And throughout our lives, God's call to us is to continue to change purposely, to draw closer to him and to be like him and in his likeness and constantly growing in sanctification and God's love and beauty and grace and his will that like the apostles, over time, we are changed. So we come this morning in our series called Win the Day, that as we focus again, winning one day for God, which we're trying to do. And if you've been doing that, you're almost up to 21 days now, right, Ken? Because it's three weeks into it, we're almost to 21 days. So hopefully everyone has 21 winning days under their belt for God this year as we set the foundation for 2023 to live for God. Now this morning we've had, we're gonna have a little fun like we always have with the sermon topics. Uh, the titles of the sermon, um, we think this one is for, for Tara because she's a carnivore, so you know it's, it's good for her, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but we're also bringing in some science in the fact that science should not be against God in the fact that who literally created science? God created science, and if you go back and you look at the early scientists, the reason they developed the sciences was to find out more about God and his presence in our lives. So we're going to use a little science, so we're not getting too far off the deep end, but we are talking about life change. We're talking about, the Bible would call it sanctification, hopefully not life change in a backward motion of falling away from God, but life change in a positive way of drawing near to God and sanctification, and the world calls that and understands and calls those habits that we have habits in our lives that either are positive or what negative negative. and we want to take negative habits turn them into positive habits we want to take positive habits and enhance them to keep going so our title for the day or today's message on our win the day series is simply this eat the frog now, doesn't that sound exciting? I mean, if you're down south and you're in Louisiana, that may sound, that may make you hungry right now. But if you're in Utah, that may seem a little bit weird. But we're going to talk about eat the frog, and actually that eat the frog is symbolic of what we're doing today. We start off with this story. Bob Specka. Y'all remember him, right? Good old Bob. Bob Specka was a sophomore at Mapleton, Maple Newton High School when he was first introduced to the induction math theory. Now, I know all of you here are familiar with the induction math theory. Maybe Ken, I don't know about the rest of us, but the induction math theory. The theory said from his teacher was likened to the theory of the domino effect. Now, do you know what the domino effect is? What's the domino effect? You hit one, if they're all lined up, what? There's a chain reaction that you knock down one domino after another, after another, after another, until they're all done. So Bob Specka took this induction theory, we'll call it in layman's terms, the domino theory, and applied it to some real life. So immediately after school that day, he went out and he bought two cases of good old-fashioned dominoes. He lined them up, 112 dominoes in a row. He pushed the first one over, and guess what happened? They all went down. Positive here, positive, thank you, not negative. They all went down and he was so excited how cool this was. The, the theory actually worked, that if you line them up right, all you do is have to have enough initiative, enough inertia, enough presence to push how many dominoes? One. 
And that one domino sets off a chain reaction with all the rest of the dominoes that it changes them. And that's where we come this morning in our Win the Day series with this domino effect that we want to realize that we start small. Now, we've all thought of big, grandiose ideas. I mean, I want you to think back. Now, this may be hard, but I want you to think back to junior high when your teachers would ask you what you wanted to be when you grow up. Well, most of us are still trying to answer that question, right? But what you wanted to be when you grow up, and then you would watch movies and stuff. You had these grandiose ideas of what you would do at this stage in your life. Well, are you there? Most people are not, right? Because somewhere in that process, things changed, we lost inertia, and the direction of our life had changed. This morning as Christians, as we talk about winning today for God, we wanna realize that we just need enough inertia, enough willpower, enough self-control in God's will, empowered by his Holy Spirit, to make small changes, to have that enough presence, enough inertia to knock that first domino down, which creates that ripple effect throughout. Now back to Bob. So Bob's first attempt at the induction theory or the domino theory was 112 dominoes. Well, Bob would go back to end up on tonight show with Johnny Carson. And if you remember that, that dates you a little bit, right? The Tonight Show Johnny Carson to show off his domino topping skills. The Guinness Book of World Records actually created a category just for Bob in 1976. His first record was 11,101 dominoes all knocked down. Bob would go on throughout his life to beat that world record five times, tapping out at a whopping 97,500 dominoes. Now I think about that in my mind and I'm like, hmm, maybe not my life goal, right? But he got a lot of notoriety about it. And the cool thing was you think about what he did. 97,500 dominoes. Do you know how long that would take to set up? Huge amount of time. But when he had enough inertia in his one finger, to push the first domino, did it take a lengthy amount of time to have the effect to knock them all down? No, it was just, I mean, it just boom, 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 and happened rather instantly. The same is true with us in our lives. If we can focus and change a couple little things and get those little things in the right direction, it begins to have that domino effect in our life to change a lot of things. Now, while Bob was playing with dominoes, there was a physicist named Lorraine Whitehead that was doing experiments with the domino chain reaction himself. Now, Lorne discovered something different. He knew you could knock dominoes down in the domino effect, but what Lorne discovered was this. If you take a domino and you line it up right, the first domino can knock something down, the second domino, one and a half times its size. And the second domino can, are you with me? Are you following? Can knock something down what? One and a half its size. Now let's see if we're all together. The third domino, when it falls, Christy's like, get on with it, John. Just go, go, go. Can knock something down what? One and a half times its size. Which is interesting for us in our life because it's not just about setting good habits and just kind of moving along, it's about compounding, right? We all hear in finance, it's about compounding interest that the best way to save money if you have like a 401k or a bank account is you put the money in the bank and when you earn interest, you what? You reinvest the interest back into the bank account and over time you have that compounding interest and it makes that sum grow and grow and grow. Theoretically, what we're talking about, the habits in our life for God, is if we can take some small, simple habits and start to have the initiative to turn them towards godliness, the next habit we face could be one and a half times the first habit, which means we do something bigger and better. 
And then the next one is one and a half times that. So as we get used to this and understand the theories, the mathematical theory and the domino effect, we realize that as we start doing little things for God, we'll call them baby steps, we can do bigger and bigger and bigger things. If you've had the class um, with Dave Ramsey on finances, he talks about taking your credit cards and some people say, well, you get the biggest credit cards first, that you have the biggest debt. Dave Ramsey has a different idea. He says you take the smallest debts first and you pay them off and then you take that money and you apply to the next debt and you grow that way. His theory is this, that when you start with the smallest one, you pay that off, there is a satisfaction gratification thing that happens, right? You have won in a small area, which gives you the motivation to win where? In another area. He says the problem with tackling the biggest credit card is that you what? You get frustrated, right? Because it takes forever, and it just seems that you're not getting any traction, you're not making any progress, you're just paying, 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 and it seems like nothing has happened. So he says you take the small one, you pay that off, and then you work on the second one, and the next one, and you get this success gratification as you go along. So I want you to keep that in mind as we're talking about changing the habits in your life for God. Well, back to Lorne. Lorne realized this in his theory. Now, this is something you want to remember the rest of your life. That if you have dominoes lined up in a row, and each one is knocking one down, how much? one and a half times its size the next one that you could do this by the time you reach the 18th domino theoretically you could topple over the leaning tower of pizza pizza now that's a fact that's very important in life isn't it actually it's not a real fair fact because the leaning tower of pizza is what it's already leaning so it's halfway over but he says by the time you got to the 21st domino you could take down the washington monument and theoretically, by the time you got to the 23rd domino, you could knock down the Eiffel Tower. Now, again, that's all symbolic. That's all theoretical, right? It hasn't been proven in real life. But it follows the theory. And we take that theory of science, that domino theory, that, that theory of mathematical induction, we apply it to our lives spiritually that as we begin to change for God, that we don't stay stagnant as Christians, we don't go backwards as Christians, we begin to make positive efforts in small areas to go forward, we can handle bigger and better. It's kind of like learning to be an overcomer, learning to be a conqueror. Because once you have a small success and you realize you can do it, what does it do for the next battle that you face in life. It gives you more confidence to face that battle. And what about the third battle that you face? Well, now you've got two victories under your belt, so you can face something bigger. It changes your mindset, that of a positive, growing for God nature, rather than, God's just asking too much of me. It's just too much. I can't do this. Because the same thing happens in a reverse order. That when we begin to tell ourselves we can't do it, and we reinforce that, that it's just too hard, too big, there's too much against us, what do we do? We begin to develop a mindset that says, I can't do it. And if I can't do it, why even what? Try, right? So we need to realize that in godliness, that we don't stay stagnant, thinking of that frog, if you have a frog in a stagnant pool and you eat the frog, you know what the frog tastes like? The stagnant pool, right? You've got to have fresh water, which is symbolic of living water. So we want to turn our habits, those small things, into positiveness for God. Genesis 11:6 gives us some encouragement. And by the way, if you want to jump in with me, we'll be in Matthew 12 a little bit later on. And then we'll be back in Deuteronomy. Matthew 12 in Deuteronomy. But 11, Genesis 11, 6 says this, and it's talking about those around the time of the Tower of Babel that when they set their mind to something, it says this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. And we know in the New Testament, the version that says, 
all things are possible in Christ, right? That our focus as Christians is not just to change habits in our life to be better people, but the reason that we change habits, the reason that we give ourselves initiative to change is to draw near to godliness, to be more Christ-like, to have more of that love attitude in the world. Again, we realize that anyone for a 24-hour period can do almost anything in God's will if we put enough effort to it. So we're not looking at our goals for the end of the year. We're not looking for our goals when we retire. We're looking at our goal for today of what can we do today what can we change today to win the day for God? So far, we've talked about two other habits. Do you remember what they were? The first one we called flip the script. In other words, take a different perspective. Instead of looking negative at things, do what? Look at it in a positive way, right? Flip the script, script. change the mi mindset, get a different view, and it changes things. The second one was we talked about kissing away. Literally about not being afraid to face the things that God allows to be in front of you. Because again, it's God's desire when you face something is not that you would fail. God's desire when you face a temptation, a struggle, a life situation, is that you would glorify Him, overcome, and succeed. Mark Twain said this, he wasn't a theologian, but he got a couple things right. Mark Twain said, If you have to eat a live frog, it's best done first thing in the morning. Now that's deep theological stuff, isn't it? If you have to eat a live frog, it's best done first thing in the morning. So what do we pull out of that that we can apply to our lives? What Mark Twain was saying was, If you have to tackle something, do the hardest thing first and get it out of the way. Because then the rest of the day is gravy, right? If you've got a hard task facing you at work or at home, do that one first thing, tackle it, get it done, get it out of the way, and move on because the rest of the day is easier. Duke University did a study that said 45% of daily behavior is automatic. Would you agree with that? You know, it's not bad. I mean, you get up. You yawn, you moan, you groan, you complain a little bit, right? You go down to the bathroom, you have, you get out there, you have breakfast, you do things. 45% of daily behavior is automatic. And that's not bad. Unless that daily behavior, that 45% is bad behavior. Now that applies to our spiritual life as well. That if we have a spiritual behavior throughout the day, a routine that we go through, but it's not productive, it's not positive, it's not drawing us close to God, it's not impacting our life, then it's a bad spiritual behavior. Would you agree with me? So what do we need to do with that bad spiritual behavior? We need to adjust it. Habitulation is not just a good thing, it's actually a God thing. It's talked about in the Bible over and over and over again, and we'll get into some of that as we're talking about changing our lives to God. Because when we have a habit in life, whether it's just in daily life or it's spiritual, it's what we call second nature, right? It just automatically happens, right? We just do it out of rote, we don't think about it, we just do it. Sometimes what we need to do though, when we realize that we're having these habits, and they're not impacting us in a positive way, we have to deconstruct the habit and step back and say, why isn't this working? Maybe it's just we're so used to it, we don't even think about it anymore. And then once we deconstruct that habit, we have to reconstruct that habit and make it into something that impacts us in a positive way. Everybody has habits, right? Good habits and bad habits. But we're talking about our individual lives because the Bible tells us to test ourselves to see if we are of godliness. Doesn't it say that? My job isn't to test Ken, Christy, or Tara, or anybody else. My job first is to have leadership in my life and test myself to see what I am doing. You guys have the same thing. 
Because self-leadership, or I should just say this, leadership in your own life starts with self-leadership. And self-leadership has to do with attuning your life to good routines, good habits that set a foundation for your life, right? Are you with me with that? Yes, no, okay. You could renew your life in Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit by changing and developing these good habits. The Bible calls it renewing your mind. There's an old computer term called Geigo. Remember that one? Garbage in, garbage out. In other words, the computer spews out only the information that you put into it. Our lives are very much the same way. That the mindset that we have tends to be what we put into our mindset. If we put in things that are negative and downward and not so good, then what is going to come out of our mouth and out of our mind and out of our heart is that same negativity, right? But if we do as the Bible says to set your mind on the things above, that which is pure and lovely and of good repute and just, if we fill our minds with goodness, and we make that effort to make sure that we are filling our minds with goodness, then that is what will come out of us. The Bible calls it having the discipline of self-control. And the reality of this whole thing about eating the frog and changing habits, the reality is this. It's not up to somebody else to do it for us. It's up to us to take the initiative to reevaluate our lives and change our habits back to godly behavior. I think the Bible calls it the way. You heard that in the Bible? There's actually a Bible called the way. And back in the 70s and 80s, there were groups called the way. But the Bible calls it the way. In other words, Jesus says that pre-Jesus, pre-salvation, there was a certain way that you were living your life. You had your habits, your routines, whether they were financial, physical, emotional, relational, social. You had your routines. But once you came to salvation in Jesus Christ, now you are on the way, which was a different path than the world. Is that biblically accurate? The Bible says you are on the straight and narrow path, not on the wide path that leads to destruction. So God says that once we come to salvation, we are on a different pattern of life. The problem is, a lot of Christians try to go back to that pre-Christian era, right? And live their life in that way. And that's what we want to put away. How do you eat the frog? Terry, you want to give us input from last time you did it? She's going, no way. How do you eat the frog? Well, we want to talk about three things this morning. When we face the habits and we face this tackle of biting off this habit, we're going to call the frog, this thing in our life that we want to change for God, we need to have three things. We need to have it measurable, meaningful, and maintainable. Does that sound easy enough? First one, measurable. I'm not asking you to eat 50 frogs today. How many frogs am I asking you to eat? One. It's measurable, right? I mean, if worst case scenario, if you were dying of starvation or you were in some entrenchment camp and, and something was going to happen, you could probably manage to handle one frog, right? Hopefully cooked. Now, 50, 60, 100, 2,000 frogs may seem overwhelming, but we could probably do one. We think about that in our life as we talk about being measurable. Getting in shape and losing weight is not a habit. Do you know what that is? You know what they really are? They're hopes, right? Well, I hope I'm gonna get in shape and I hope I'm gonna lose weight, right? But it's just this vast thing that's out there, right? Well, I'm gonna lose weight this year. Well, how much, when, why are you gonna do it? Well, I don't know, but I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna diet, I'm gonna, I'm gonna exercise, I'm gonna lose weight this year. And what happens to most people? That hope is devastated in January after they've made that New Year's resolution. Haven't even got through one month, right? Why is it devastated? Because it wasn't measurable. It's just something out there we're gonna do, this vast big thing, I'm gonna lose weight, I'm gonna get in shape, 
and there's no defining to it. There's no limits, there's no deadline, there's no boundaries. So in being measurable, measurability keeps us with the goal and focus. I look at it like this. If I'm gonna exercise, well, I'm not gonna say I'm gonna run a marathon, but here's my measurability. I can go out every day and I can walk one block. Is that attainable? Is that measurable? Does it have boundaries? Does it have limits? And somewhere along that, after I've done that a number of days, I realize I'm starting to get some benefit and I change my mindset. I flip the script again, as we talked about in the first sermon. And we say, you know what? I can walk one block a day. Maybe I can what? Walk two. So the next day I walk two blocks and I do that every day for a while. And what do I realize? Huh, I can walk two blocks. Maybe in our domino effect, I can walk four blocks. Do you see how being measurable helps us to attain things? If we just say, I'm gonna exercise and lose weight, that is a hope that's out there that is just, you can't wrap your hands about it. But if we say, I'm gonna have a healthy breakfast and this is my breakfast, in my case, the last three weeks, it's little sesame rolls and half an avocado, and then I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna walk a block a day. It's measurable, it's attainable, it's doable, it's realistic, and when you do it, you get some self-gratification that you are capable, which gives you the incentive to do what? Do more. So, take a habit that you wanna change for God. As we're talking about one habit today, one frog, we're gonna, we're gonna eat, What's one habit in your life, and how do you make that habit measurable for God today that you could accomplish that today easily, and then you could do it again tomorrow, and you could do it again the next day? And then as you realize you're not just conquering, you're conquering every day for God in that habit, you become more than a conqueror, how can you adjust it to a bigger goal, but still measurable? So the first thing is we want it measurable. Does that make sense? You all with me? Second thing is we want it maintainable. We'll put it this way in our symbolism. We're gonna eat one frog, right? That's measurable, just gotta do one. <laughs> We're not gonna eat the whole pond. One frog, maintainable. I'm gonna eat one frog a day for a week. In other words, I'm gonna tackle this habit and turn it back to godliness in a simple way, every day for a week. Is that possible? Could we accomplish that? Absolutely. And then at the end of the week, maybe we could adjust it. Here's what I want you to realize with being meaningful. Wait, I, I got ahead of myself, so let me back up. Measurable's first thing, meaningful's the second thing. Sorry, Tara, on your notes, I gotta back up. Measurable, meaningful. Why is meaningful important? Because if it doesn't mean anything to you, what's your attitude? Doesn't matter, really don't care. I'm not gonna do it. But if it becomes meaningful to you, then it's worthwhile doing. Here's how we wanna define being meaningful. The Bible says that when Christ was in the upper room, there was an interesting thing that happened. That all through the apostles' three years with Jesus, he had been teaching them about servanthood, about serving others before serving themselves. Is that correct? About loving others more, forgiving, serving. Then when they're there at graduation ceremony in the upper room, the final culmination before Jesus is crucified, this is the graduation ceremony as a had the Last Supper, what we call communion, every apostle failed. Because none of the apostles got up and washed the other apostles' feet. Which in that setting, in that time frame, that was the thing you did to an honored guest when they came in. Because you're walking around the dirty, dusty land of Jerusalem, of Palestine, of Israel someplace, you would come in and to honor your honored guest Someone in the house, usually the lowest servant, would take and take your sandals off when you came to the door and they would wash your feet as a sign of honor that they are glad you're here. How many of the apostles 
when they came into the upper room and that graduation ceremony of their, their spiritual graduation with Jesus, how many of them washed the feet of others? Not a single one. Do you know why? Because at that time, the apostles were still focused on themselves and what they could get. Remember, James and John are arguing who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Peter is making promises he can't keep. Lord, I will go with you even to the end. I will never forsake you. They were all still self-focused. In other words, the life in Christ hadn't impacted them yet to where it was meaningful enough for them to actually change their mindset. There was only one who washed the feet of others in that upper room. And who was that? It was Jesus. Because it was meaningful enough for him to continue to train the failed apostles in the way of godliness, which was servanthood. Jesus had been pounding down in their brains for three years. Get out of your own head. It's not about you. What you have is not about gaining more and keeping it all to yourself. It's about sharing and contributing and serving and blessing, putting others above yourself. Is that accurate biblically? And the apostles failed on graduation night because they're still, it's about me and what I can attain and what I can do and what I can have and how I can keep my stuff. Jesus, in his heart, before he's faced in his death, said, You know, guys, I love you so much. I, as the very Son of God, will put on the loincloth. I will take the lowest place as a servant, and I will wash your feet. Because you are so important to me that I can't afford for you not to learn this lesson. Does that make sense? Jesus was the only one in that upper room in a simple way of saying, the training, the habit change, the life change was important enough to do the action. So Jesus was the one to wash the feet. So how do we make things meaningful in our lives? Well, this is going to rock some of you because it's pretty big and scary. You got to realize this. The habit change that you're doing, the frog you're eating today, the thing you're changing is not about you. It's the same story as the apostles in the other room, upper room. It's not, life is not about you. First, it's about glorifying God. And how do we glorify God? By serving others. You make the habit change meaningful because Yes, it's going to benefit you. That's a side characteristic. But you're going to do it for your spouse. You're going to do it for your children. You're going to do it for your best friend. You're going to do it for somebody else. You're going to do it for those at church because it has impact on their lives. The whole point of our lives is to leave a godly legacy for others to follow, isn't it? To glorify God, enjoy Him forever, and leave a legacy that says, that man, that woman, glorified God. If anything, if I struggle in life, I can look to them as an example. You make life meaningful by, by setting the habit you're changing to be a legacy as an example to other people. Does that make sense? It's not for you. It's for the third and fourth generation. It's for those in your neighborhood, those you work with, those around you that you change to bless them. And when you do that, unlike the apostles in the upper room, you pass graduation day because you're the one to wash the feet. You're the one that says, I am not so proud that I can't wash somebody's feet. They should be what? Washing mine. I should, when we get into that habit, what we say is this, I should not have to change for you. You should change what? For me. And Jesus exemplified exactly the opposite. His statement that his training to the disciples, to the apostles, was so important that even before his death, he had to make the time to take the point of a lowest servant 
and teach them one more humbling lesson, hoping they would get it. Put that in our lives. Do we demand and expect people to do things our way, the way we want it? Most people do. I'm going to tell you what, that is worldly living. Because the world wants it their way. Christ-likeness is making it meaningful that, you know what, I will adjust for you. Now that's easier said than done, isn't it? I mean, as I'm preaching this, I'm thinking to myself, that's a hard thing for me. I struggle with that. But that's the call that God calls us to do. So first thing is measurable. We need to make it measurable. Second, we need to make it meaningful. In other words, we need to make it a blessing to others to glorify God by serving others, by changing in a positive way. And third thing is maintainable. Maintainable. Like we talked about one frog a day for a week. We could do that. Change it into something a little bit more appealing. Walk one block a day for a week. Can we do that? Absolutely. And then we can adjust and we can go on. When Jesus said, follow me, the big implication was for life and eternity, right? But the practical implication was for how long? Right now, today. If Jesus walked up to you and walked in this room and said, hey, come on guys, follow me. Would we be thinking about, well, man, 50 years from now, maybe this is what my walk in Christ would look like and I need to contemplate that. If we did that, we would miss the point, wouldn't we? If Jesus walked in and said, hey, come on, follow me, what would the call be? To do it right here, right now, today, in the moment, right? That's the call. It's maintainable. It's able to do, because again, we could do almost anything within a 24 hour period with the help of the Holy Spirit to win the day for Christ. So here's the question with the habit you were thinking about. As God is speaking to you in the Holy Spirit, in essence, he is saying, follow me today, right? So do you think about it, or do you what? Do it. The call is to do it right here, right now, without exception, in the moment. And then we realize we can do that tomorrow when Jesus comes back and says, hey, I want you to follow me. We've got one day under our belt. We can do it two, and then three, and the four. Measurable, meaningful, and maintainable. Here's the next thing about our habits for Christ and changing them. There's two things about habits called habit switching and habit stacking. Habit switching and habit stacking. In the gospel, there's some amazing things about habit formation if you look at them. Look with me in Matthew 12. Matthew 12, verse 43 to 45. This is Jesus talking about an unsaved person being controlled by the evil, the God of this world, and what happens when they're freed if they don't change their habit, which we call habit switching. Matthew 12, 43 to 45 says this. When an impure, or we'll say an evil spirit comes out of someone, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says what? I will return to the house I left, and when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and it takes with it other seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, to go and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. So how does this apply to habits? Habit switching. If we have a habit that is negative for our godly life, and we don't do something with it to change it to positive, what is the progression of that habit? It gets worse, doesn't it? And the condition of our life is now worse than when we just had the one habit. Because again, remember, it's compounding. It's that domino effect that one thing in our life affects another, affects another, affects another. And so when we allow that one thing to stay the one thing without switching it out to something positive, it begins to have a domino effect in our life. The Bible calls it the principle of reaping and sowing. And Christians who are lazy 
and selfish and self-indulged and self-entitled hate the principle, the biblical principle of reaping and sowing. Do you know why? Because the principle, the biblical, the godly principle of reaping and sowing says this, what you plant, key emphasis on you, what you plant is what? What you gather. In other words, it's not somebody else's fault and it's not God's fault. God saved us in salvation why does he need to be the one to keep doing everything for us? After salvation, God gives us the principle of reaping and sowing. In other words, God says, in your spiritual life, if you choose to plant good seed, to change in positive ways for me, what are you going to gather in time? Good spiritual habits, good spiritual lifestyle. But if you plant laziness and procrastination and stubbornness, and hard-heartedness, what are you going to reap in time? Those same things. The principle of reaping and sowing is very biblical. That God says you need to be conscious about what you plant in a small thing, right? Are seeds big or small? Overall, they're what? They're tiny. I mean, Christy and I plant them every year in our garden. And some of them, when you get like little fennel seeds and lettuce seeds and celery seeds. I mean, they are just tiny, minuscule things. I mean, you can miss them easily, but they grow into something bigger over time. The reality is for us in changing our life towards godliness is we need to be careful of those little things that we do in life, be conscious of those, and make sure they're leading us in a godly direction. And here's the reality. You don't break a habit by not doing it. You know that? Stop sinning. How's that one working for you? You still sinning as a Christian? Yeah, man, that didn't work. I can't just break it by saying I'm not going to do it. I break it by doing something different, by changing it. Mindset is this. I don't stop a negative attitude by just saying, I'm not going to be negative. Because then you become negative, right? You change a negative attitude by saying, I'm going to be conscious of what I speak and say and only speak words of edification. Is that biblical? Words that build up. Words of gratitude. You see, you don't just stop something by, or change a habit by saying, I'm not going to do it. You have to replace that in your life with something positive. There's also something called this in science called a double bind when it comes to change. Double bind is this. It says, when you make a statement, it almost creates a barrier that you can't do it. Let me show it to you this way. Here's our double bind. Whatever you do right now, I do not want you to think about the Jolly Green Giant. What are you thinking about? Right? I just told you not to do something. And when I told you not to do something, what's the first inclination? Well, your mind is racing about the Jolly Green Giant. Ho, ho, ho. Right? That's what science calls a double bind. You don't stop something by saying, I'm not going to do it. Because what you actually do in that moment is you create a barrier that you can't overcome. Does that make sense? Don't think about the Jolly Green Giant. And your mind goes where? Ho, 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 Green Giant. Saying we're stopping doing something doesn't work. We have to replace that with something that does work. Second, with that, we have to have a vision bigger than ourselves. Again, making it meaningful. Our vision about changing our habit has to be bigger than the negative habit. Jesus says, give us our daily bread, not our monthly bread. Because in daily bread, we come back to him. And in changing a habit that's bigger, it gives it meaning. If I say, like I have these last 21 days to practice out my own sermons, I'm going to eat a healthier breakfast every day. Why do I do that? 
Well, number one, because I'm overweight and my pants don't fit anymore, right? Number two, because I feel the lethargy in my life and my body that I know I'm out of shape and I need to change something. So I'm gonna eat healthy, so Christy has to put up with me for another 40 years to be around and provide for. Now I say that negative way, I should change that to positive way. But it's having a goal that's bigger to bless others. Becoming healthier, not just for my sake, but to be able to be there and provide and help and do things around the house that she cannot. And to be there for my children and my grandchildren and my church. I make it bigger and better and I do it daily. 1970s, Dr. William Glasser wrote a groundbreaking book called Positive Addiction. Addiction is not all bad. Do you know all of us are addicts? Addiction is not always bad. Now, sure, there's the negative addictions that, that destroy our lives one drink at a time, one click at a time, one look at a time, but there are also positive addictions. Do you know that? Positive addictions. I'm a Christian and I love Jesus more than myself. I'm an addict. I'm a Jesus addict. It's a good thing, right? I'm a Jesus freak. Here I am, join the club, come with me. Not all addictions are bad. And the goal of changing these habits in our life for godliness is to make a positive addiction in our life where we are, for us today, addicted to God. What do you do when you're addicted? You can't get enough. Let me ask you a frontal question. Does that describe your life right now? That you literally can't get enough of Jesus every single day? For most Christians, it doesn't. The reality is for most Christians is we can't get enough of ourself because we're addicted to us, not to Jesus. What I'm asking you to do in this series is to create a new addiction, one small habit at a time of drawing you near and near and near to godliness that you are addicted addicted to Jesus Christ. You literally cannot live without him. You cannot think a thought without him. You cannot do things without him. And all your mind is swelling and centering around who? Jesus. A good, positive addiction. The last thing I'll close up with this. We've talked about switching habits. You can't just say you're not going to, you're just going to stop a habit because you actually create a barrier, you have to switch that into a positive habit. The other thing we talk about habit stacking is this, that again, that domino effect, when you do one habit and you are successful there and it falls over, it hits the next habit, the next habit, the next habit, domino effect. Turn with me back to Deuteronomy 4, 6. The idea of habit stacking is as old as Deuteronomy, which was written around 1406 BC. So it's, it's biblical, it's not a new thing, we put it in modern terms so we can understand it, but it's a biblical thing. Habits of stacking it says this, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. You shall keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Do you see the levels in there? God is one, we gotta know that first. Then you will love the Lord God how? One with all your heart, two with all your soul, three with all your might, fourth, you will keep all the words that God has commanded you. He just told you four things to do, right? Four things to do to honor God. Actually five. First one, know that he's God. Second, love him with all your heart. Third, all your soul. Fourth, all your might. And fifth, keep God's commandments where? In your heart. Do you see the stacking effect? But it goes on. If you read verses 7 to 9 of Deuteronomy 6, it tells you more of how you'll do that as you progress in spiritual faith. And it says this. How do we do that? How do we keep our love for God and our heart, mind, and soul, and strength and obey His commandments? We pass them on to others. Recite them to your children. Recite is one. You've got to speak them verbally. To your children... It's a specific audience group that's number three. And talk, number three, about them at your home, specific place. And not only at your home, but where? When you're away, that's fifth. 
When you lie down, that's number six. When you rise, that's number seven. Bind them, number eight, on your head and your hand. Fix them, number nine, as an emblem on your forehead. Write them, number 10, on the doorpost of your house. And number 11, write them on your gates. There's 11 ways that God tells us how to love him with all our heart, mind, and strength. Recite, to whom children talk in our home, when we're away, when we lie down, when we rise up, bind them on our hand, fix them on our head, write them on our house and on our gates. Do you see what God's doing in that progression? He's not just saying, hey, follow me. He's telling us how to. This is how you follow me. You make me part of everything you do in life. Modern science would put it this way with habit stacking. We do it with things that are rote that we do all the time. Does anybody have an alarm clock? And what do you do when the alarm goes off the alarm clock? You hit the snooze button, right? Alarm clock wakes you up. You go downstairs, at least you do in our house, and the first thing that's on there that you stray for is the coffee pot, right? When you were in school, when the recess bell rang, did you get excited? Yeah. When the lunch bell rang, did you get excited? Yeah. These are physical routines that, God, that we are familiar with that are triggers to make us do these things. So in Deuteronomy 6 verses 7 to 9, God gives us 11 specific things to do that are routine throughout our day. Any of you around children? Any of you talk? Any of you ever be at home? Any of you ever be away? Any of you ever get up? Any of you ever put things up on the walls of your house? Any of you ever have something out in front of your house? God says you take these things and you place them all around you that they remind you all day long to follow him. And that's what we're trying to do. Here's a summation. You show me your habits right now, whether they're good or bad, and I'll tell you your future. Someone in Maine just won a 1.3 or a 1.31 billion dollar lottery. Here's my concern about that person that won that money. Suddenly they have a lot of money, and like most people, they say, "Well, when I win the lottery, when I have a lot of money, I'll what? I'll do all these things." You know the problem with that is, if you won't do them, and you don't have much, you won't do them when you have a lot. Over my years as a pastor, I always had people come up and telling me, you know what, when I get a raise, when I get a bonus, when I do this, I'll tithe because I just don't have enough money now. Never happens. Do you know why? Because they won't take the self-control to change their life to do what God calls them to do now. And that bonus when it comes, the raise when it comes, well, there's always more stuff to buy and things to get and places to go. And God never gets his portion. Change in our life for God begins with small things, not big things. We talk about eating a frog. It's like pick one thing today, a small thing, that's measurable, meaningful, and attainable that you can do for God to win today for God and glorify him. And here's the other thing. We'll close with this one. Consistency always beats intensity. You ever have a big goal, you come out of the gate and you're so excited about, man, you're just raring to go. And then three weeks later, you fizzled out. Consistency of doing it day after day after day after day builds a habit for foundation of serving God. And as we become addicts for God, we want to do the things on a small basis every day that draw us near to God and pull us away of our selfishness. And can keep feeding that every day. That after a while, we don't know even why we love God so much. We just do it because it's become so much a part of our lives. It's just who we are. Sound good? Let's go eat the frog, right, Tara?
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for science that it shows us in ways that we understand how we can change for you, how it reflects your word. Lord, I pray as we listen and hear the message, we wouldn't get too bound up on the, the science part of it, but what we would focus on is your word, your way, and how you would have us to change to glorify you. That you remind us of your deep love for us, which changed everything. And you would call us to be active for you, living for you, loving you, serving you by serving others. To not have the focus on ourselves, but on how we can glorify you by blessing others with our lives, our abilities, and our resources. And we ask this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.